Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. You are in the webinar of Crucial Skills for Engineering Managers, the Neuroscience of Leadership. My name is Shane Hua. I'm the Program Manager for CU Boulder's Engineering Management Program on Coursera. Thank you so much for being here today. We are really excited. Um, so as we wait, go ahead and click on the Q&A icon and put in what is something that you want to learn today? What is that one thing that you want to take away from the webinar today? Um, if you don't know where the Q&A icon is, it is located at the bottom of Zoom. And there's an icon right next to the chat that says Q&A. So go ahead and click on that and put in what is one thing that you want to take away from the webinar today? We'll give everyone a couple minutes to, um, to put in their answers. This webinar is being recorded, so all of you will receive a co copy of this recording in a few days. So if you miss anything, that's totally fine. You'll be able to catch up. Um, we will also have a Q&A feature at the end of our webinar so that um, throughout the webinar, if you have any questions for our presenters, especially about the neuroscience of leadership, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A as well. So we'll be able to get to those questions at the very end. Ah, I see Russell says that they want to learn about how to be a better leader while well, you're in the right spot. Lillian is curious about, is there a biochemical mechanism associated with leadership personality types? Wow, I love that question. And then Caleb is interested in new leadership pathway that might be possible. That's a great question. Thank you so much for weighing in. Perfect. All right, next. Without further ado, let's welcome our presenter today, Professor Ronald Duran Jr. Professor Junior, uh, Professor Donna, uh, Ronald Duran Jr. teaches two of our Master of Engineering Engineering um, Leadership courses on Coursera. One is Leading with Your Brain is the Neuroscience of Leadership. The other one is Principle of Leadership, Leading Oneself. So some of you may have already taken some of those courses in the past. Now, Professor Duran, what is the fact that you want to share with our audience today about yourself? Oh gosh, what's so what's interesting about Professor Duran? I've got a lot of things that I could I could put on that list. Um, I just published a book. That's that's kind of interesting. And I've also done some crazy things like I've run 50 miles as an ultra runner. I've done an Ironman triathlon. I've played baseball at Coors Field, and I've done a TED Talk. So here, there you go. There's a there's some things to uh, to make me a little bit more interesting. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh my gosh. That sounds awesome. Um, thank you so much, Professor Duran. Would you like to tell us more about the neuroscience of leadership now? Yes, uh, let's just uh, start with the idea. Of course, you can see it's a three course series. Um, I created this, I, I feel like it was three or four years ago. I created this on campus and it's become more popular every semester that I that I offer it. Uh, so it's it's the students like it. And I think the reason that you are all here is because you're interested in how, essentially how the brain works, right? Otherwise you probably wouldn't be sitting in on this. So if you have an interest in, in neuroscience and, and it's more than just the brain, but if you have an interest in neuroscience and leadership, it's kind of a nice thing to put those together. So here's what I would say about the three core series. I recommend, we don't have a prerequisite, but I recommend that you take neuroscience of personal excellence first. That's the one that's going to kind of give you the background on, on some of the terms that we use and that sort of thing. Um, and, and again, so the way this is set up is personal excellence is leading yourself, leading teams. I think that's that's obvious. And then leading organizations. So depending on where you, you want to focus. Now, of course, I'm biased. And I think you should take all three. But again, start with personal excellence and then you could easily jump to the other two um, as you, you, see, you saw need. That's what I would tell you about the course. So yeah, if we go back, let's just jump to the next slide, Shane. Um, so understanding the engine, the way I kind of like look at this is you might get a, a, a general idea of what I'm thinking by looking at the, the slide, right? And so let's just imagine a fictional story of, let's say I'm, I, I own an auto shop, right? I'm an owner of an auto shop 
and I have an open position for an auto mechanic, right? So I need somebody to come in and, and be one of my auto mechanics. And, and you come in, and of course, we're going to do an interview. And one of the questions in the interview is I say, well, what do you know about how an engine works? Tell me, tell me about your knowledge and experience with how an engine works. And if you were to answer, I have no idea how an engine works, Ron, but I know I can be a good auto mechanic. What are the chances you think I'd probably give you a job? Probably pretty low, right? Uh, we need to understand a little bit how the engine works to be an auto mechanic. Well, what about leaders? You know, when I, if we spin this to say this brain that we have is directing so much of our behavior, our motivations, uh, the way we act, uh, not only for ourselves, but, but also our team, right? Have you ever watched somebody and say, why are they behaving that way? Well, with a little bit of knowledge about about neuroscience and psychology, you can start to kind of demystify when you see this, this behavior that you don't understand, right? So understanding the engine, we're gonna call the, the brain, the engine in this sense, will really truly help you be better leaders. So that's the idea behind this course. If you click on the, the next uh, animation here and the next one, Shane. So one of the cool things about this, this course and really neuroscience is, here we are in, in 2024, and I'm not a neuroscientist. I have no, no advanced degrees in neuroscience, but the, the people that study this, the really smart neuroscientists out there, they don't know how, everything about how the brain works. There's still some parts of the brain that are mystery, even to the people that spend their lifetime studying this. So it's a little bit of an untapped frontier. So when we step into this class, I tell my students, this is, this is kind of a cutting edge course. And uh, most of my students enjoy that, uh, that, that idea that it's kind of out there. Uh, there's still a lot about not only how the brain works, but how do we apply that to leadership? That's still unknown. So you're going to be kind of on the, on the forefront of that when you start to apply some of these, these tools. Shane, click one more time, please. All right. So how does understanding the brain, I think I've kind of maybe already touched on that. How do understanding how the brain works help us be better leaders, right? And again, I always want to say, let's focus first on ourselves. Can I start to understand why I do the silly things that I do? You know, how many of us have made just decisions that we go, oh my gosh, why did I make that decision? Usually it's in hindsight, right? Or, um, you know, any number of things. Why under pressure do I seem to forget everything? Well, we'll touch on all of that when we, when we get into this course. Let's go to the next slide, Shane. Okay, so... Of course, you're here because of leadership. At least I hope you're here because of leadership. You're probably also here because of the neuroscience. I mean, the, the title of the course, Neuroscience of Leadership, I'm assuming those two are obvious. The psychology part of it, it's not as, as big a part um, of this course as the, the neuroscience and leadership, but we do bring that in as well. So you can look at these three kind of facets um, as, as things that we're going to look at in this course. And notice how under psychology, I have black box in, in uh, parentheses there. So to describe that. So if you've ever taken a neuro or a, a psychology course, you're probably going, oh, I remember something about this. Well, let's go to the next slide. So what is that black box? Okay. Now, if you've taken most, at least college level psychology courses are going to cover this. I would assume that, that most all introductory psychology courses are going to talk about this. Uh, what is the black box? Well, let's let's kind of back our way into that. Click on the on the next animation there. There, okay. So, in psychology, usually they're looking at a stimulus, and then click again, Shane, and they're also looking for a response or an output. So you get you got the input into the black box, you got the output coming out of the black box. Psychology is really looking at that input and that output. What is that black box? Well, that mysterious black box is our brain. And for the most part, psychologists are not too concerned about what is the inner workings of the brain? I, you know, I don't know what's going on in there. I can see the output. I can see the behavior. That's what's important to me. And of course, the input's important as well. But what's going on and all the details of, of the black box are not nearly as important to a psychologist. But if we click on the, on the next animation, really what kind of demystifies that is the neuroscience. So neuroscientists are, are very interested in what's going on in the black box so that's kind of their sandbox if you want to look the powerful combination when we take neuroscience 
we combine it with psychology. Both of them have a lot of uh, useful things that we can use to be better leaders. And so we can bring those two together. That makes a, a powerful kind of toolbox for us. And so that is kind of a little, again, again at the heart of what we're going to do in this course. Let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to almost rapid fire through some slides here just to give you a taste. You know, this is my 15 minute um, this is my pitch to you. In 15 minutes, I want to hook you to get you to sign up for this course. So I'm going to show you some really cool slides and, and talk about some of the cool stuff that you'll learn. Of course, we're not going to get into it deep because we only have 15 minutes. But one of the things that we talk about quite a bit is neurotransmitters. And I'll just quickly say that neurotransmitters and um, hormones they some there's actually some neurotransmitters that depending on where they originate in the brain or i mean in the body uh, can be either a hormone or a neurotransmitter we're going to stick with neurotransmitters for right now and what are the big what are the big ones right the big one that almost everybody's heard of dopamine right everybody's heard of dopamine uh this is that feel good neurotransmitter uh you know you get it from things like oh gosh alcohol drugs Sex, jelly donuts, video games, social media, all of those are going to be driving our dopamine system. And I'll tell you, and this is something you, you intuitively know. In, you know, modern society, they have learned, and I say they, I'm going to put they in quotes, those that are in the, in the world of taking money from us for not taking, but, but getting us to spend money have learned how to game the dopamine system. Okay. And so that's not to say that we're victims, but to start to understand why the, you know, why we are driven by dopamine as, as modern humans, um, not only can it, again, help us lead ourselves better and have a better life, better mental health, better, uh, mental well-being, but also we can see this in our team. Right. And so most, modern humans are addicted to dopamine. And so one of the things, we'll, we'll just kind of look at that and we'll say, and, and I always like to say, I'm not here to tell you how to live your life, but I can offer you suggestions on ways to kind of pull back from that dopamine addiction that we all have, including your professor. I'm still kind of battling this because, you know, everything is directed toward that, right? Um, and so understanding how dopamine works is, is just a, a huge driver for behavior. Some of the other ones that, that I won't speak to at a, at a you know high level here, but serotonin, uh, we'll talk about that. Oxytocin is another one. Cortisol, uh, adrenaline or epinephrine, norepinephrine, you, those are all pretty much interchangeable. But so those are some of the big ones that we'll look at as far as neurotransmitters go. And what do each one of those do? How do they affect our behaviors? How do they affect our decision-making? You know, again, not only when I make a decision, I'm like, to buy something, those neurotransmitters are gonna play a part in that. What about when you're marketing for a company? You wanna understand what the neurotransmitters of your customers are doing. And again, this is not, they, there is actually a lot of companies out there that have neuroscientists on uh, on the payroll to do things like this. So we'll understand it from both sides. You know, if you're gonna be the 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 person in marketing that's that's driving these, these campaigns, the neuroscience behind that, sometimes it's called neuromarketing. Uh, is important. And also as a consumer, uh, so you can hopefully not make too many purchase, purchases that you you regret later, uh, that will help as well. So that's neurotransmitters. We'll talk about that as we move forward. Shane, let's go to the next one. Okay, so at the beginning, again, in the, in the first course that we take, the first part of the course it should be should be obvious that we're gonna we're gonna go into some terms that maybe or maybe not you know maybe you've heard these terms maybe you haven't but it's gonna feel a little bit like you're going into a neuroscience class you're gonna learn about parts of the brain you're gonna talk, talk we're gonna learn about those neurotransmitters we're gonna learn about the autonomic nervous system which I'll show you a little bit later in this um, and so a little bit of this might be new especially if you've never had a class in neuroscience or psychology. Most of my students enjoy that. Some of my students will say, oh my gosh, that felt like a lot. And I would say, if it feels like a lot, don't feel bad. Again, there's no prerequisite for this. But as we go through the course, it'll start to make more and more sense as we, as we progress through. But we've got to come up with a common language so that we can kind of all be on the same page. So that's going to be how the course starts. Let's go to the next slide, Shane. 
All right. So the big players in the brain that, that we're going to talk about, we talk about several areas of the brain, but really the big ones are going to be the, the next three that I'm going to show. The prefrontal cortex, this big forehead we have, modern humans have, you know, you, you're probably laughing going, hey, we don't have big foreheads, Ron. But if you look at like Neanderthals, you know, many thousands of years ago, we look at our ancestors and they had that sloped forehead. They didn't have a big pronounced forehead like we do because they didn't have a fully developed or, or such a, a well-developed uh, prefrontal cortex. This is the newest part of our brain. This really is what makes modern humans special is that prefrontal cortex. There's other species um, that, that have a prefrontal cortex, but it's not nearly as developed as, as human prefrontal cortex. Sometimes you'll hear it called the neocortex. Um, it's not quite exactly an interchangeable term, but neo being new. So again, think of that as the newer part of your brain. Uh, the other thing about the, the prefrontal cortex, if you're listening and you're under the age of 25, that part of your brain may not be fully developed yet. There's, there's no hard and fast rule that it's 25 years old, but that part of our brain usually doesn't become fully developed till about 25 years old. Okay. So halfway through our 20s. And so what does that mean? That part of the brain is going to be used for logic, reason, uh, solving calculus problems is going to be, is going to be that part of it. Also impulse control. Okay. So that's why we see a lot of young folks that struggle with impulse control because that part of their brain is not fully developed yet. So again, that is not to make you feel bad about yourself. Um, just means that you have some things to look forward to maybe. And I would also say that just because you're under 25, or if you are, uh, doesn't mean that you can't work on that skill. It is it, all parts of our brain. This is called neuroplasticity can be developed almost like a muscle. We can develop parts of our brain as, as well as impulse control. So if you struggle with impulse control and you're you're 21 years old, you can develop that even at that age. Okay, so don't don't give up hope uh, on that. But it's just kind of a fascinating uh, tidbit of information. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Shane. So the next one we're going to talk about. This is a big player. This is called the amygdala. I'm going to use amygdala. That's the the singular um, of of amygdala. And so amygdala is Greek for almond. And so you can see that it's two almond shaped. Um, Parts of our brain and if you were to draw a a line between the temples and uh you know in our head that's about where the amygdala is at. it's closer to the center line the the thing that the amygdala really drives is the fight or flight mechanism if you're, if you're familiar with that most people have heard of that so that's what's going to drive that it's also kind of where emotions are going to originate it's part of the limbic system and it's a powerful part of the brain when we get scared, when we feel pressure, let's say you, you have to do a presentation and you forget what you have to say, that's when the amygdala is in overdrive, okay? And we'll discuss that in great detail in the class. But I always say the amygdala's job is to keep you alive long enough to reproduce. Keep you alive long enough to reproduce. It's really always, it's searching the environment for threats. It's to keep you safe to keep you alive. And it's also going to be the part of the brain that lights up when we see somebody that we're attracted to, right? Because that's going to be that reproduction part. So again, it's it's a bit primitive, but it's very powerful. And it can shut down the prefrontal cortex because it has that much power. So that's a, a big player in what we do. Let's go to the next slide, Shane. Okay, and the last third, the third one that I want to introduce to you is called the, the anterior cingulate cortex, the ACC, as you can see from this, this graphic, it's in between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. Remember, the prefrontal cortex is on the outer layer of our brain, and the, and the amygdala is a little bit more toward the center, and this is in between, and the anterior cingulate cortex will light up, and it will see activity in there when you're doing things that are hard. If you're making effortful decisions, let's say as an ultra runner, I want to go out and I, I got to go for a 20 mile training run. And I'm thinking this is going to be hard, right? That part of the brain, we can, I'll see that part of the brain light up. The good thing about this is when we do hard things, that part of the brain can actually grow. Again, that's that neuroplasticity in action, but doing hard things makes it easier for you to do hard things in the future. And so we can actually strengthen that part of our brain and if you're connecting the dots, you say, what about moral implications or ethical decisions that are hard? Absolutely. That is going to be a big player 
um, in those in those kind of those uh, decisions that we make that are hard in life. So again, another again, hopefully you're taking away that. Wow, that's fascinating, and we'll go much deeper into that in the in the class. All right, let's go to the next slide, Shane. Okay, this is our last slide, and then I'll hand it back to Shane. And and again, I, I may have mentioned, maybe I didn't. When I talk about neuroscience, sometimes I get lazy and I call it brain science. And the neuroscience has always slapped my hand. And they say, no, Ron, it's not brain science. It is brain science, but it's much more than that. All right. So when I talk about neuroscience, sometimes I get lazy and say it's brain science, but it's also the nervous system. Okay. And the nervous system, the big part that we're going to talk about is going to be the autonomic nervous system. And so think of the autonomic certain nervous system as in two components the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system is going to be that fight or flight that I mentioned earlier. Remember? So when we feel threatened, the sympathetic nervous system is going to be activated. Parasympathetic nervous system is going to be often, they, they term that rest and digest. So that's going to be when we're more calm, when we're relaxed. And so again, we have this, this kind of spectrum in between, right? We've got parasympathetic and sympathetic on, on the extremes and we're kind of moving all the time. We're, that autonomic nervous system is moving back and forth to adapt to our environment. When do I need to step on the gas pedal and when do I need to hit the brakes? The gas pedal will be the sympathetic nervous system. The brake pedal will be the parasympathetic nervous system. And so once we can start to understand how it works, can you imagine what that might mean to you to perform well under pressure? We discuss that in quite quite a bit of detail, right? How, if I'm too over aroused, how do I back down my arousal to get in my sweet spot so that I can nail the job interview or nail that presentation that I need to do in uh, you know whatever we're we're doing in life? Or maybe you want to go ask that you know that pretty significant other out for coffee. That's a pressure situation too. So even those sort of things, what you're going to learn in this course will help you with that. So there's my 15-minute pitch to get you to sign up. Again, this is a very popular course with my on-campus students. And even with a lot of people that have gone through the Coursera course, I've, I've gotten emails of people saying, wow, I love that. So uh, if you're here, I think you're, you're well positioned to take advantage of a course like this because you're interested in leadership and you're also interested in how uh, neuroscience works. Those two are a powerful combination. So back to Shane, and we will do questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, yes, here's a reminder to put any questions you have into the Q&A feature, and we'll get to that. We already have some really cool questions there. Thank you so much for putting those in. Um, so here's a couple facts about the University of Colorado Boulder. The University of Colorado Boulder is a world-class university with over 850 visiting international scholars. Founded in 1876, we're a tier one research one institution. Our graduate engineering college is ranked top 19 in the nation, and we have graduated five Nobel Prize laureates. Our accredited Master of Engineering and Engineering Management degree and graduate certificate offers the same diploma as our on-campus degree and certificate. The difference is that our on-campus degree requires a rigorous application process. And our Coursera degree does not require any application, prereqs, um, GRE, TOEFL, letters of recommendation, nothing like that. All you need to do is to prove that you can do the work by earning a 3.0 CU Boulder GPA and complete one of our pathway specialization in either finance for technical managers or project management. So those three credit pathway specializations include three one credit courses. Students will need to complete all three one credit courses to complete the pathway specialization. And once you do that and earn the 3.0 CU Boulder GPA, you will be admitted to the Master of Engineering in Engineering Management degree. The degree is 30 credits. It includes um, several courses that you, um, Ron teaches. It also includes um, other core and elective courses. Our graduate certificate is nine credits. And if the 30 credit degree and nine credit certificate sounds like a lot. There's definitely a light touch way. Um, you can take any of our individual courses as a non-credit course 
or as a four credit course to get credits from CO Boulder. For the non-credit side, you'll be able to access most of our course recordings, our readings, our um, videos using your Coursera subscription. It's a monthly subscription, I believe about $59 a month. And you will earn that specialization completion certificate if you complete the specialization. On the four credit side, if you do want to get credits um, from CU Boulder, then you will have to enroll or upgrade your dump credit content using that enrollment form and then pay tuition. A huge perk of being a CU Boulder student is that you will, once you are a CU Boulder student, you will get access to um, the CU on Coursera non-credit courses for free. So that included not only our 45 engineering management courses, but also Master of Science in Data Science courses, Computer Science courses, and Electronical Engineering courses. If you have any questions about the program, you can email coborder-mem at coursera.org, or you, if you want to have a live conversation with one of our enrollment counselors, you can leave your phone number after clicking Request Information on our program page. So you can see this is our program page at the top. You can also Google CU, um, CU Boulder, MEM, or Engineering Management, then you will be able to reach us. All right, let's dive into some of those questions. Okay, Ron, are you ready? I'm ready. Perfect, okay. The first question from for us is that, is leadership a, and in, um, a built-in trade or can it be learned? Oh, wonderful question. And there's some debate about this, right? There's some, I don't know, I, let's call it arguments about this. I absolutely believe that it can be developed. Do, now here's what I would say to this. Um, of course, I wouldn't teach a leadership course if it couldn't be developed. So yes, I, I was never that much of a leader. I went through this program and nobody would have put that label on me as a leader. Uh, I certainly think I'm squarely in that category now. All because of what I've learned, or not not all, but, but a lot of what I learned in the program made me into the leader that I am today. So that's what I would say. Now, there are some people that have some innate, you know, something in their genes that they come to it a little bit easier than others. What do I say to that? So what? So they're a little ahead of you, right? You can pass them by with, with good, diligent study and working on your skills developing that toolbox, uh, you can pass by the people that have a head start on you. Uh, the other thing I want to say is many people think you need to be extroverted and loud to be a, a good leader. Absolutely not true. You can be introverted and even quiet to be a good leader, right? And a lot of times we see charisma show up as being an important trait for leadership. You can have charisma even being quiet and introverted. Isn't that kind of crazy? So Absolutely, it can be developed, and I think that everybody has some tools to bring to the table. Uh, again, even the quiet, introverted ones can be great leaders. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, the next question we have from Nashat, how does neuroscience play a role in leadership? Well, I think I touched on that a little bit, but but again, let's let's re reemphasize, you know, understanding how that engine works, right? Once we can start to understand our behaviors, why, you know, are you motivated every day? Uh, I would say you probably everybody's going to raise their hand and say, "No, I'm not motivated every day." Okay, what's going on there? Why are we not motivated? It's not mysterious. I mean, some of it is, but but a lot of it's not. And so we can understand what is it that that drives that. Why are some days I'm motivated, one some days I'm not? Well, number one, you're human. Let's start there. But again, a lot of that is going to be driven by our hormones, our neurotransmitters, uh, what's going on in our environment. All of those inputs go into our brain, and that computer is, is making calculations. Uh, I always like to say if you're not motivated, there's a good chance it's because you're tired. Okay? Why are you tired? And again, some of that is going to be directly related to the brain and neuroscience. And so, again, the whole course... We're going to dive into answering really that question. Uh, I I certainly could could talk to you about it for for many hours, but that's kind of a taste of understanding how neuroscience ties into leadership. Perfect. Uh, finally, we may have question uh, time for one more question. So from Lillian, is there a biochemical mechanism associated with leadership personality types? You know. Uh, 
You've just stretched me to the limit. I do not know. That's a great question. Um, you know what I like to say to my students when I don't know? Number one, I like to say, I don't know. I'm not afraid to say, I don't know. And number two, I'd say, let's go out there and learn that together. Um, there's, a, there's, there's many things out there that I would say, if, if you were in my class, I'd say, let's you know go out there and do some research. Find some research papers. Do a, a search. By the way, if you decide to go with our program, you have access to the University of Colorado library system. Go find some research papers, and I can almost guarantee you, if you typed in that question, you'd probably find some research around that, and then have fun. Some of them are fun to read. Some of them are not so fun to read, but that's that's where we start. And then I would say, come back to me and tell me so I can learn with you. So I don't, I don't have a good question or a good answer to that, but that is a fascinating question. And I see there's a couple questions about the program. Um, you can definitely start with a graduate certificate and then complete the degree. You can, you know, work towards your degree at, in a flexible way. Our courses don't expire until eight years after. So you technically have eight years to complete your degree. People complete at different rates. Um, all right. Okay. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, we've had a really lively conversation. We really appreciate all of you here. Um, Professor Doran, what kind of closing words do you want to share? Oh, you know, I feel like I've already kind of put it out there, but one more time, I'm going to say this is a fascinating course. It's cutting edge. It's really kind of this new, this new way to look at leadership. Uh, I I have coined the term neuro decade. I believe the 2020s are the neuro decade. You can tell people you heard that from Professor Duran because uh, I've never heard anybody use that. And the idea is you, you see things like neuro business, neuro strategy, neuro parenting, neuro marketing. So again, it's really this idea of how can we apply that neuroscience to almost everything we do in life, not only leadership, but but all those little you know facets that I just talked about. And that I think that is where we're heading in the future, not only now, but but in the future. I think many more people are going to be, I don't know, amateur neuroscientists, kind of like me in the future. So this is a really exciting area to um, to explore. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Duran. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You will have a copy of this recording in just a few more days. So watch out for that email. All right. Have a good one. Bye, everyone. Thank you.